answer me these questions three. One, what is the most popular Dungeons and Dragons actual play show ever? The two, what is the most well-known catchphrase to come from Critical Role? Uh, how do you want to do this? Oh! How do you want to do this? Oh! How do you want to do this? Oh! Take that. I've been watching your show for so many years. <laughs> I got a how do you want to do this? Yes! Oh, oh, yes. Man. A three. Can we take this idea and use it in our home games. Yep! All right, thanks everybody. Short video today. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. This should be yeah, on the shorter side, but not that short. Listen, no matter how you feel about Critical Role, there's definitely plenty we can learn from it. And by taking what may be the simplest technique we can uh, borrow from Matthew Mercer, steal. All right, we'll say steal. Uh, stealing, <laughs> how do you want to do this, is a quick and easy way to up your game. But the point of this video is that we can take that idea as a starting point. And with a very slight adaptation, we can get the players at our tables thinking way more creatively, embrace role playing much more deeply, and engage with the game on the whole other level. Sound good? Yup! Hey everybody, I'm Ryan Doyle, and this is the Verdigree Table, where I've been saying, how do you want to do this whenever a player character scores a killing blow for years and years now? In fact, there are people who have played with me that have not watched Critical Role and think I made that up. Now, I have never claimed that I did, but if that's an assumption they're going to make, I won't correct them. Stealing cool things that you love for your game is a grand tradition I suggest you embrace. And the people who do get the reference are going to appreciate it even more. It's not stealing, it's an homage. How do you want to do this? <laughs> When a dangerous monster drops, the final enemy is felled, it is a moment worth emphasizing. That's just one of the many lessons we've learned from Mortal Kombat. Boom! Get over here! If you say, how do you want to do this to mark that beat when the big bad hits zero, you are not only teeing up a moment for everybody to cheer in victory, which is very nice, you are also giving them an opportunity to do something cool. You are passing them the ball so that they can dunk it. In the kitchen time, Players love doing cool stuff. It's obvious, but so obvious, we can lose sight of it sometimes. We're playing this epic, heroic fantasy game for a lot of reasons, but a big one is to get epic with it. Once everyone knows what you mean when you say, how do you want to do this? I bet even the quietest, most you know, comfortable observing from the sidelines kind of player gets at least a little more descriptive with their killing blows. But look, here's the thing. Oh, I hate when people say that. Here's the thing. It's so stupid. Just say the thing. We don't have to just save this for the final moments of combat. We can be encouraging players to get more engaged, more descriptive with it, by simply asking them this question, how, when their character does a thing. When a PC is doing something for the first time, using a new class ability, or like casting a spell that they just gained, I try to make a point of asking them, what, what does it look like? When you're doing that, when the barbarian enters rage or the monk uses focus, what do the people around them see? Eldritch Blast is Eldritch Blast, right? But if one PC is hurling Fanta black balls of writhing tentacles and another's firing off day glow pink cartoony clouds, that single detail says a lot about who these different warlocks are, what their characters are like, what kind of patrons they serve. When we introduce a character, we describe what they look like often, but what, what does their weapon look like? What does their armor look like? We can also ask these questions whenever a PC purchases an upgrade or discovers a magic item. Maybe the appearance of the Master Sword, the Rod of Seven Parts, is of particular relevance to the lore of this world, but odds are, most of the time, you can give the players control over what their new toys look like, and it won't change much of anything, except for how much fun they're having. And I will take things even further, and I use this technique for skill checks as well. What seems more interesting to you? I check for secret doors, bruh, 18. Or, I check for secret doors by running my hand over the walls, feeling for indentations or seams, maybe even a draft, 
And now maybe we reward the player who gets descriptive with it by giving them an advantage on the roll. Or here's something that might get me in trouble in the comments. If the character does a good job searching for a secret door in a spot where there is a secret door, maybe I just let them find it. That's the old school way of doing things. A little crazy, right? I like you, but you're crazy. But I've been using this approach more and more in my home games, especially during social interactions. Make an appeal to an NPC that aligns with how they see the world and what they want out of it, and hey, it succeeds. We only have to go reaching for the dice when the outcome is uncertain. Say it. Yes! Wait, 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 say, it. Wait, 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 say it! Say it! Say it! Say it! How do I want to do yeah. this? Now, one compelling like counter-argument to this idea is that the character might have all this charisma, and it's not fair to expect the player, the actual person, to craft this persuasive speech. It's not like we're making the strong character's player get physical when they attempt an athletics check, right? And that's, that's fair. I'm definitely sympathetic to that. The point is to increase the fun here. We're not trying to force people into discomfort. We're creating opportunities to engage with the game at a deeper level and reward creative thinking. You better think, think. So I say you can explain how your character does something, and if it would work, that can get you a success without leaving things up to chance. Or we can leave things up to your modifiers and roll the dice. Either way, player's choice. Speaking of freedom, Bob Worldbuilder did a video recently about what he calls the blank check. Brad Wolf, GM Jim, and I took a look at that one in our casual Friday conversation recently, and the consensus is we've all kind of been doing this for years, just never formalized it and gave it a clever name, like Bob did. Good job, Bob. The concept is basically to not assign a specific skill to a specific challenge, just decide on a DC and let the players decide how the characters are going to approach things. And a few people in chat pointed out this is pretty much a very similar concept to skill challenges, just kind of implied more generally instead of siloed into a type of mini game we bring out once in a while. You know, I've always wanted to do this. <laughs> hey, Luis. Yes. How do you want to do this? <laughs> Again, by setting up the players to consider how they want to do this, we encourage them to think outside the box. When I do this at my table, I actually don't even have like a static DC. The way I see it, Different approaches might make it easier or more difficult to achieve the outcome we're hoping for, right? It might be a DC-15 to use thieves tools to pick the lock, but if we're trying to kick down the door, well, now maybe we're talking more like a DC-20 athletics check. Persuading this wizard NPC by appealing to her with the promise of the magical knowledge she's been after for years now is going to be easier than trying to deceive her since she's way smarter than your character. You will do well to remember it. Wait. Now, personally, I might let that attempt to persuade the wizard auto-succeed, if it's well-reasoned enough, based on an understanding of the NPC's motivations. And I wouldn't require the player to, like, give the whole pitch in character. It would be enough to describe the gist of what the character is saying. We talked about player skill versus character skill, roleplay versus roleplay in this video recently, so I'm not going to rehash how trying this approach out and some other old-school techniques can take your game to the next level, but you should definitely watch this one if you haven't yet. And even if you don't make leaning into asking how as part of your Dungeon Master approach to running your game, it's a great little trick to have in your repertoire and your back pocket when a player is asking to try something and you are just not certain if you should let them, right? If the druid's trying to use their wisdom in a certain situation, it's up to the player, not the Dungeon Master, to explain why this is a reasonable ask. So often as the DM, we're trying to yes and things, we kind of hesitate to say no, but asking how would your character do that, or maybe what would that look like, opens things up for the entire table to decide if a certain action is possible within the shared understanding of the game. Maybe the player talks themselves out of it. Maybe they convince everyone they've got a cool creative idea. Either way, we're playing this game at a deeper level now than we would have if we simply hadn't asked a question, how? Matthew Mercer, how do you want to do this? <laughs> Whoa! That's what it feels like! That's cool! I could go on, but I put it to you, dear viewer. How would you use and adapt this technique at your table? 
Maybe you've already got some epic stories because you've said, how do you want to do this? Or perhaps your own version of that phrase already in your games. Please let us know in the comments. I would love to see folks swapping ideas down there. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Be kind. Have fun.